Hello, here we are in the human evolution section of the Morian Hall of Paleontology at the Houston Museum of Natural Science. And today we are celebrating, actually the entire month, we are celebrating the discovery of a fossil called Lucy, a nickname that everybody knows. On November 24th, 1974, Don Johansson and his team worked in the deserts of East Ethiopia, in the Afar region, and sort of an educated guesswork led to the discovery of a fossilized elbow joint. They had found in the years before a kneecap and some other indications that there was probably life, animal and early human, to be found, fossilized, of course. So one year, 1974, they went back looking for more. And as luck would have it, and Don Johansson mentioned the story that he got out of his uh, Land Rover and he looked to the left. The sun was shining at the end of the day, kind of low over the horizon maybe, just the right way. And it, it glinted, it kind of bounced off this upright bone which he identified and his uh, fellow colleagues identified as belonging to an early hominid and not a non-human or non-hominid animal. So they started working in the weeks and years afterwards and in the end, they found a fossilized skeleton, but 40% preserved. 47 bones of her skeleton were preserved. And that evening, the first evening of the discovery, when it was pretty evident that they had found an early hominid, there was a celebration back at headquarters in the field. And apparently in those days, they had cassette recorders. And so they were playing a song by the Beatles, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And apparently with the, the help of the cassette and maybe a few beverages, the decision was made to nickname her Lucy. That is how we know her here in the Western world. Now, if you go to Ethiopia, they know the name Lucy, but they also call her in one of the many languages in the country, Dinkanesh. And that really means you are beautiful. So maybe we can call her Lucy or Dinkanesh. Either way, it works. We have here next to me, on my right-hand side, a three-dimensional reconstruction of what Lucy might have looked like. This is an adult form of an early hominid. When she was found at the time, she was the oldest known hominid in 1974. And with hominid, it's um, a word of the trade, so to speak. It's an early human ancestor. She was not very tall. I would not have made it in any of the basketball teams, WNBA or NBA, nothing of that. But she um, had all kinds of trades in her that may literally stand her out and not as uh, chimpanzees or non-human primates. And, and I would like to talk a little bit more about that in the window behind me. So let me move over and make a few points here. Lucy, when she was found and her skeleton was analyzed, showed traits that are very similar to some degree with us modern humans. That's us over here. So obviously you can tell a difference in size. But we have a display in the museum in which we explain how a scientist, when you find a skeleton like hers, which is a replica of which is right here, whether or not that is part of a creature that could walk upright or not. And for comparison, what we have here is a representation of us. We know we can walk upright. Representation of a chimp, and we know they cannot. They can stand upright, but not really walk upright like we do. And then we have Lucy. And so we can go through the list. I will not, I will invite you to come visit the hall if you can. But with Lucy, there are a lot of traits in her knees, her feet, her hips, her backbone, and the skull that point to her being a lot more similar to us, especially when it comes to walking upright. And that is very important because, first of all, at that time, that was the earliest known evidence of walking upright. By now, we are 50 years later. Time moves on, and so do discoveries. A lot more evidence has been found of even earlier, about twice as early. Now we're in the 6 million year range before Christ. But in this case, it was 3.2 million years ago. And she was, at the time, the oldest known evidence of walking upright. 
Chimpanzees can stand, as I mentioned. We can go to the zoo and see this. They might waddle maybe three or four steps, and then they have to go back down on all fours. And with Lucy, that was not the case. Why is that important? Well, when you stand upright, there's all kinds of theories, but think about it. You walk upright, you have your hands free to hold things. It could be a child, or it could be tools. Now, was she using tools? We don't know. But there are stone tools old enough to be contemporaneous with her. We don't have evidence of a fossil like her making tools or using tools. But how does one even find that? Are you are we expecting to find a fossil in the ground with a startled look on their face and a stone tool in their hand? Of course not. So by inference, maybe she was familiar with making tools. Maybe not. It's not just stone. She might have been engaged in extending her body, as in using tools with a stick. And wood, of course, does not survive that long. And so if she ever did something like we see in the animal world today, termite fishing, sticking a stick in a termite nest and pulling them out and then eating the termites, as we see today in non-human primates, maybe she did something along those lines and that would not have been preserved. So it is possible she used stone tools. It is possible she used uh, more perishable uh, tools. And she would have been able to do that because she stood upright and was able to use her hands. Now, Lucy came to the museum here in Houston in 2007. This was the result of the Ethiopian government making the decision that she could travel, and so she did. She came to Houston first because of a connection between a Houstonian, a politician, Mickey Leland, who uh, was very concerned when he was alive uh, with uh, uh, Ethiopians' famine. And so he traveled over there quite a lot to help out and sadly uh, perished in a plane crash in the highlands. So there are lots of buildings, streets, schools named after him. There is one here in Houston as well. But Mickey Leland is a name. Houston is a concept that is very well known in Ethiopia. So when the government made the decision that she could travel as part of a larger exhibit on the country of Ethiopia, and it's very long prehistory, the decision was made she will go to Houston first. So we were very happy about that. We put literally our best foot forward to be able to receive her, and, and we did, so we were grateful for that opportunity. And when she came here, it was for the purpose of a tour in the United States. So she came to Houston first, and then traveled on to the Museum of Science in Seattle. She also went to New York. She went to the Bowers Museum in L.A. and then back home. But in between her stay at the museum for an entire year, 2007 to 2008, first of all, a lot of visitors came. But secondly, there was a time period between her stay here and her travel to Seattle where she was allowed to go to the University of Texas in Austin where the geology department was able to scan her for about two weeks. Every single second of that time period was used in the presence of a representative of the Ethiopian government, a man who has always handled her remains. None of us ever touched her remains. But the scans were done, the data were collected, and then shared with the government and the museums in Ethiopia. And then one of the professors at UT Austin, Professor Kappelman, wanted to uh, look at the data and see what he could find in terms of the internal structure of her leg bones, her long bones, and how walking upright might affect or have affected the, the interior build-up or build-out of, of the legs. And he shared with me later that as he was looking for answers to one particular question and looking at the scans, think of it as very highly sophisticated x-rays, he found something else. It's always the same. You're looking for an answer to a question this way, and, and the data shot at you. Look at this instead. So what he noticed was a lot of breaks. Yes, her skeleton was well-preserved, but it's still 40%. It's not complete. So um, he looked at it, and something popped at him, and he confirmed this idea he had, this notion that he had, that she had broken a lot of bones with other people in the field, and even with a doctor in Austin, who treats a lot of living Texans who go skiing in Colorado and find a tree to smash into and break their legs that way. 
he put the x-ray in front of the doctor, not saying anything else, saying, what do you see? And the person said, this individual broke his or her legs or his or her bones. And, and so what we have now since 2015 is an article that was published in Nature about the possible reason of Lucy's demise. At the time when she was alive, she's quite diminutive. She would not have been able to fight off any predators like prehistoric lions or anybody else who might look at her and her offspring as lunch or dinner. And she escaped them by, at night, climbing into a tree to go to bed. Now it appears that she fell out of the tree. And she probably was knocked out or died on the spot. And so that was the side end of Miss Lucy or Dinkaness here. But the opportunity that was provided of her coming over here and before she went to Seattle to be scanned, which at the time was not possible in Ethiopia, was an incredible opportunity because it moved science forward. And the data, still available, of course, forever, to researchers will no doubt lead to additional insights and discoveries related to human evolution. So her visit to Houston, her U.S. tour uh, at the time, she went back five years later, was not only a benefit to visitors, but also to anybody studying human evolution and, and school children today. So for that, we are grateful. And we are also grateful to be able to uh, retain a bit of the story here. This particular uh, 3D rendering was made uh, for the museum by Gary Staub. So we're grateful to his talent. And she's still with us because that was part of our exhibit. So she traveled with the exhibit and eventually came back home over here. The real Lucy, or Dinkanesh, is now back in Addis Ababa at the National Museum in a state-of-the-art research facility. So people can go visit her there, not on display. Proud to say this was possible here, but she's not on display in Ethiopia. So uh, researchers can have access and people otherwise see what we see here, which is a replica of her skeleton. That's all good, and I think that's the end of my story in this case. Thank you.